enough about my sore calves and hip and thighs. <clears throat> <laughs> Don't put that at the front of the Welcome to Literary Cannibal, a podcast for anyone who wants a fun and feisty conversation about books. Literary Cannibal is inspired by the work of the Stella Count and the Vita Survey that reveal the ongoing gender imbalance in the conversations we have about books. Literary Cannibal is striving to correct some of that imbal imbalance by talking about books written by women from around the world. I'm Kirby Fenwick and I'm joined by Neve. I'm Neve Lani, student by day, writer, editor by night, and reader by nature. And Fee Murphy. That's me. <laughs> oh, I know I always mention things that I've seen, but legitimately this was cool. This morning, a guy walking up the street, quite good looking, so I did a second glance thing, had a bird on his shoulder. No way. <laughs> legitimately. <laughs> I was like, control yourself. <laughs> About the bird, not the good-looking guy. It was a good-looking yeah. bird and a fine-looking fella. <laughs> so to our book for episodes, episode eight. Episode eight? Eight is great. Yep. That's exciting. Ghosts, haunted houses, no people come to life, talking dogs and talking frogs, and an interesting new perspective of a very old Christmas story. Jeanette Winterson's Christmas Days, a collection of 12 short stories, features all those things and more. The more includes a dozen recipes interspersed between the stories. Little vignettes that not only give us a recipe, but also give us an insight into Win Winterson's Christmases. Published in 2016, Christmas Days adds to Winterson's impressive list of publications. It includes novels, a memoir, children's books, and a comic book, which I only discovered after reading this book and I really want to track down. Mm. But for you brought this to the attention of the pod cast. <laughs> um, why? Tell us why. Um, it's probably not a good reason. And it's probably uh, kind of just made me a little bit more uh, resolute in my opinions of Christmas. Um, I'm not that Christmassy at all. I might be shocking because we're surrounded by Christmas right now in this room like there are seven Christmas trees in the flat but I'm not that Christmassy so when I saw this book I thought oh my goodness this could be my way into Christmas because I'm a big fan of Jeanette Winterson and I've read several of her novels and find them utterly moving and fantastic so mm -hmm. I thought she's the master with the pen start Anything written by her would be wonderful. Mm. So I was quite keen. And I'm still not that into Christmas. I'm sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> what did you guys think? I really I really enjoyed it. And mm. um, perhaps I should preface that by saying that I'm a big Christmas person. It's probably my favourite holiday. <laughs> um, I, I enjoy the whole thing. I'm one of those people that loves the carols and I have worked in retail for a number of Christmases. So I still love the carols despite that. I love the Christmas songs. I love the tree. I love the decorations. I love the spirit of Christmas. Um, even that wintry spirit, which is quite, um, I mean, it's not what we experience in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> um, so I, I really really liked this collection um mm. i found it quite um there's a there's some supernatural elements and a bit of like um a bit of magic you know in in so many of these stories which mm. i i really really enjoyed um i haven't read a lot of jeanette winterson's work um not because i don't want to just because there are bazillions of books in the world and I want to read all of them and <laughs> it's really it's really difficult for me um but yeah I I really enjoyed reading this book yeah what about you Neve? it's really interesting because I when I you were talk, talking to me about this book and like oh there's gonna be recipes and I'm like Ugh, okay I'll just <laughs> skip by the recipes because I'm not a cook and I never will be um, interestingly, I actually enjoyed 
the sort of vignettes about her life and her friends kind of more than I enjoyed the stories. <laughs> Thousand percent. Like, they were so well done, though. Yeah. Mm. I, and they're just, all, yeah, they were just beautiful, like, little touches of, you know, memories and, like, people and they were, and um, history as well. It was really engaging and, yeah. And I think it kind of speaks to that idea of um, food being such a big deal around Christmas mm. and, and, and even such a big deal, uh, you know, it's such a huge part of the way we connect with each other and our, with our families and our friends is food for, yeah. like, I mean, that's a universal human thing, I think, across all cultures and communities is that idea of food. And so she's kind of tapping into that with these Christmas recipes, which yeah. are kind of non-traditional Christmas recipes like they're yeah they're, they're kind of interesting aren't they yeah exactly it's so associative like it's all about it's she's not trying to be a generalized Christmas this is very much about her Christmas and her experiences um she brings in a whole lot whole lot of like outside information about I really liked the bit about um Shakespeare and Company because mm. oh my god I I've never been to that store but I want to go yeah and sort of her Reading about how her, how she went there, I was, I was like, oh wow, such goals. <laughs> That's I really enjoyed exactly what both of you just said. The recipes, by far, and the intro to them were just such a relief that um, it kind of made up for all the other awful stories in here. <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought that all the short stories in here, I had to wade through. They were so. Um, sentimental, which I just despise. They're all about morals. Everything had a lesson and a moral and a happy ending. And I thought the characters were really thin. I thought the writing was really terrible. And I was like, Jeanette, have you lost your gift? You're like this wonderful writer. But then as soon as I got to the vignettes about food, it was the writing just sung and it was glorious. And I don't think it was just... Um, the food that made that so evocative, I think she didn't fall to any tropes because there are no tropes in her life. Whereas mm. the Christmas stuff was like trope, 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 sentimental crap. Ugh. I kind of feel like Jeanette <laughs> Winterson feels sentimental about Christmas though. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, Fee, that you're aware of how she grew up. She grew up, yeah. Yeah. she was adopted and she had quite a harsh mother from mm. all accounts. Um, but Christmas was like the one time of year where she was happy regardless. Yeah. And so I kind of feel like she feels sentimental about Christmas. And so maybe that's why those stories are sentimental. And I didn't mind the happy endings. There was a lot of cliche yeah. and a lot of predictability. Like you knew what was coming. But I didn't mind that. I think that's okay sometimes, especially when you're talking about something like like Christmas, which is kind of wrapped up in a lot of cliche and predictability and, you know, all that stuff. But, it, but yeah. the real Christmas isn't in terms of that's the kind of um, packaged up stage version of Christmas is that it's perfect and wonderful and it's like every challenge is overcome and we're all happy and together. But her real life Christmases and those vignettes are messy and chaotic and there's a different cultures coming together and different people coming together and there's community and atmosphere mm. whereas the story version was very like same same flat kind of I, I don't know there was no texture and there was no way in it just kind of felt like different versions of the same story 12 times mm. I don't know I for me I felt like some of the ghost stuff felt a little sort of repetitive. I don't know if repetitive is actually the right word. Oh my but God, I'm feeling really cold. There's a ghost in the room. Ah, look, the same stuff again yeah. and again. And I feel like the, you could... This, this Tell us definitely, how you really feel, I'm not sure. <laughs> there's potential for that to become really interesting, but I felt like so much of it was like her sort of trying to build up tension and I'm like, well, I'm not feeling tense. Like these are ghosts. This is a Christmas story meh yeah no i there was no tension for me in the ghost stories it was just yeah. like um yeah just like what's gonna happen like you kind of 
yeah, there was no tension there. But there were yeah. like I really enjoyed the snow mama story. I thought that was really oh yes, was I was really in fun. The, in the back of my mind, I was actually thinking snow mama is the exception to this. I yeah, I really. Enjoyed I thought that it. was a really fun story, that's especially gorgeous. the part where there's a snowman sitting on the bench or something that's like has not come to life, and it's like, what's wrong with that? Like, what's going on there? And it's like, oh, that was that was built by an adult. And so there, there's no kind of imagination in, yes. the, in in that. And so that's why that snow person is like not come to life. Oh, it just has some great sort of Peter Pan velveteen that rabbit vibes. And mm. I was just like, mm, yes. Yeah. And there was, <laughs> the, I, I liked the, um, the mistletoe bride too, where she mm. escapes what is uh, going oh, yeah, to be a nice. pretty terrible situation and she manages to escape with the help with the help of another woman mm. i quite i quite like that one I, I feel like that could have been expanded because it's sort of a nice so it's not it's maybe as like broad as the version is maybe like angela carter sort of yeah oh, for sure know, sort of bluebeard scenario but it's definitely a subversion so i feel like that could have been sort of i wonder if there is a little bit more. um of you know, that idea of trying to fit into that 12 days of Christmas with 12 stories and 12 recipes and and mm. maybe there was a little bit of, um, you know, because some of those stories could have maybe done with some expansion, but yeah. then how, like, maybe it's more of a decision about in, trying to include 12 stories. Yeah. And so some of that expansion and exploration gets lost i did kind of um i had that similar thought as well of like oh my goodness this is i kept trying to remind myself that no jeanette really has certain values and um really loves christmas for certain reasons so stop being so harsh fiona but at the same time i'm like oh i'm a reader give me something but at the same time um the one story that really kind of shone for me, and I think it's because I know that it's um, been turned into a picture book, was The Lion, the Unicorn, and Me. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that one was gorgeous. And at yeah, that like point, that. I was mm. like, oh, these, are, these stories would be infinitely better if they were read aloud and shared aloud and performed. Um, I saw her um, speak, I think it was last year. It was cold that Melbourne has very long winters so that doesn't mean anything that could be any like mm -hmm. yeah, seven it could have been period January <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was uh, the book was uh, an adaptation of a Shakespeare story I can't remember the book can't remember the Shakespeare thing classic but um, she didn't just read an ex excerpt from the book she stood on stage and she performed it mm. with sound effects and voices and posturing and mm. she moved about the stage and she's a writer not an actor and it was magnificent it was so engaging that i was probably if i have seen her perform these stories i might enjoy them more but they were really flat on the page mm. maybe that's yeah, maybe that's how they're supposed to be. Like performed, like mm. actually, you know, mm. spoken aloud around a. I don't know. I read this book and I, I get that sort of like real um, Northern Hemisphere Christmas, you know, where you're yeah. all around the fireplace with a cup of mulled wine and everybody's rugged up and it's like, my God, Christmas in Australia, you're generally like shorts and a t shirt with the air conditioning on and having a zuper duper, you know, like. Adding away the flies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, that idea of, of, of performing that. Mm. I did like, um, the intro to the book. I, I did really yeah, like that. that was really yeah. I didn't realize it was going to be a highlight for me. So I wish I read it a little bit more slowly, but like how she, <laughs> <laughs> God, <such a... laughs> uh, you know, I've got thoughts and opinions, <laughs> um, but it's a nonfiction bit. So again, it stands out as being fantastic. And she just goes through uh, all the different history of how Christmas has evolved mm -hmm. into what it is. Yeah. Did make me more anti-Christmas after reading it because I'm like, <laughs> it's such a constructed, consumeristic, nom, 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 nom. So 
don't know if that was the desired <laughs> effect, but I certainly went with that filter into the stories of um, yeah. not feeling uh, super cheery. I think the point was that like it's sort of a hybrid holiday that you make personal. Like every person sort of brings something different and then some of those things become traditions that other people like for example i'm just staring at this christmas tree and that didn't become really widely used sort of in england until you know albert so it's some things we think of as sort of like oh traditions are actually quite recent and Mm -hmm. yeah i I do agree like the whole thing of like oh chris like christianity trying to take over pagan holidays is not kosher but a lot of things with like christian churches if you go back are kind of like oh that wasn't right (laughs) and christmas is no exception and it has evolved into yeah. like a holiday that, um, yeah, like you said, people bring to it what they want and they mm. interpret it how they see and they experience it and celebrate it or not celebrate it as they see fit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jeanette sort of mentions a few times how different cultures sort of approach Christmas and that sort of holiday holiday time. Uh, she talks about like, this isn't Christmas, but sort of in that sphere, like Yom Kippur, which is sort of that reflective time and sort of New Year's. So I think, yeah, it was, I think it, it worked because it was so invested in her experience, but then also the nonfiction bits really shone because she didn't just dwell within herself, but sort of looked outwards as well. Thousand percent. Mm. Can we talk about the actual aesthetics of the book? Oh, yeah. Because it is um, one of the most attractive books. <laughs> like, it has this gorgeous cloth um, navy blue cover with this beautiful white um, sort of illustrations on the front. And, and just oh. even inside, like, just the way it's kind of laid out and, and the text and the pictures and the the use of you know the blue and the black and Mm. like aesthetically it's a really really pleasing book it is gonna make such a great gift when i gift it on (laughs) (laughs) oh man and it's gonna be so easy to wrap because it's a hardcover so it's got Mm. those nice clean edges and i haven't folded a single page (laughs) (laughs) looks like i haven't read it (laughs) which is and there's no tabs which if you know Fee is like probably the most damning yeah. element of this entire It is, it is. And I only just realized when you mentioned it, there are no tabs on your copy. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it is really gorgeous. And I think actually I could have done with more illustration, especially with the, I think a um, lot of these pictures lend themselves to illustration, um, you know, like the snow mama and the lion, the unicorn and yeah. me. Oh yeah, definitely. That, and like the silver mm. frog, like so many of these stories lend themselves to illustration. And it's funny you bring up that the unicorn, is it the unicorn, the lion and me was turned mm. into a children's book. Cause I wonder if like, like. Quite a few of these stories could actually be children's books. Like Silver Frog could be a children's story. Yeah. Um, Snow, Snow Mama, Mama could, could be, be a children's story. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of these stories could be um, kids' books. Yeah. Like illustrated kids' books. I feel like that's actually, she sort of has like the two, most for most stories, the two speeds where it's sort of like ghost story around the fire, let's creep each other out, or like sort of, sort of, um, children's like story of like here are the villains here are the children and you know let's go i think actually snow mom is the most effective because it doesn't have any real clear villains as opposed to some of the other ones who are a little bit more mm-hmm. moralistic dickensy in their yeah in their story yeah hmm. so i i think we've probably got one solid thumbs down ah uh, one <laughs> thumbs up and one kind of my, my, I'm doing like that Julius Caesar sort of like half thumb. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, I, I'm ready for Chris Pringle. I think other people would find many joyous things in this. But um... has it has it changed your um, opinion of Jeanette Winterson as a writer? Has it impacted your your feeling about her as a writer? Not too much because of the nonfiction bits. Because yeah. I thought. They were really engaging and just mm. so delightful. Um, it just 
a thousand percent her, which I've said like ten times, so three thousand percent her. <laughs> of um just yeah, I think she's a really, really lovely writer. I mm. think Christmas means a tremendous amount to her and mm. she's exploring that and creating that I assume she's attempting to create that feeling in the reader. Mm. Definitely didn't work for me. I'm all I came to it not really enjoying Christmas, so I think and it's not that I don't like Christmas as such. I, it just means different things to me than it does to Jeanette. So, like, yeah. when you were describing that Northern Hemisphere Christmas, that rings true in this book. It's, yeah, It's absolutely. a very place-specific sort of Christmas. Mm. The sort of Christmas I have in my family is really casual. We just kind of wear PJs and play board games and don't do yeah. much else. And we don't really decorate because there's too much faff in that. Mm, yeah, it's a fatless Christmas. <laughs> okay, well, I'm I'm a thumbs up, um, but obviously I'm coming from a place of um, someone who's really quite invested in Christmas and mm. um, um, has a lot of, and I think it's because it's a real family holiday for me. Yeah. It's spent with my family. Um, and, yeah, so I'm coming from that place where it's a really um, – I wouldn't say important, but it's just something that um, I value that time of year with with my with my family. So I'm I'm a thumbs up. Yeah, as previously mentioned, I'm like a halfway thumb. I don't know. I really enjoyed the nonfiction elements in this book, and I found them really interesting. Like learning more about her and her friend. Like she um, also exploring in depth like those female friendships was like two thumbs up. Maybe what Very Jeanette nice. needs to do is write. <clears throat> a Christmas book that's like non-fiction where she's exploring her own sort of traditions yeah. and memories and recipes and experiences of Christmas. Maybe that would fill your boat for you. I love that. <laughs> I mean, we'll let her know. <laughs> I mean, the only thing that like could be criticised is like name dropy, but I don't even care about that. Like, Oh, like, no. I, I, name I, drop actually, I, I think I read that criticism of it and I just thought, oh, God, how boring. Like, what is she yes. supposed to do? P- pretend that she's not friends with these people or... Or she's not married to these people. Or they're not part of or her life. Or using yeah. an initial. Like, oh. my famous friend, N, who cooks for a living and has, like, TV shows. Exactly. Mm, I wonder who she is. <laughs> I know. I just find that really, like, mm. in those instances, I feel like she's just talking about her experience. She's not name dropping. Yeah, exactly. And also, she's not She's not saying, oh, I know this person and moving on. She's talking about their, fr- their friendship in relation to Christmas and how they view Christmas and their traditions together. And actually, I think the whole tradition element is probably the part of the book that I like. I really engaged with because I'm a little bit sort of so-so on Christmas, but I'm one of those people who really like creating traditions and like going back, doing the same sort of thing with the same people. And so elements in that book of this So book, the pickle, the making of the pickles really, the pickled cabbage really yeah. appealed to you. Yeah, so those types of elements in this book, I was like, yeah, that sort of sang to me. Yeah. Awesome. (laughs) Perhaps next year we should read some other Jeanette Winterson to sort of... Mm. I was kind of thinking ahead. I'm like, what are we going to do for next year? It's like, save me. (laughs) (laughs) Can we do something about New Year's or something like that? (laughs) We'll have a non-Christmas book for December next year. Or maybe just just a a a... non-Judo-Christian. Or maybe something... Jewish, I don't know. Some, yeah, that something could of be another fun. faith. Yeah. yeah, or a non-fiction, okay. no sentimental stuff. Just you know, <laughs> straight to the point. <laughs> I feel like uh, Kebby and I are a little bit more sentimental than our, our sort of like. Oh, approach. I embrace. I embrace my my sentimentality. That's yeah. <laughs> I embrace my non-sentimental side. <laughs> <laughs> When Snow Mama comes back, it's like I've been waiting for you. How that not like be like, oh, that's nice. I, I think that was probably my favorite story. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> no, no love, Get no, love, so no love for Jeanette Winterson's <laughs> Christmas days. <laughs> So to our recommendations for this month, what have we been reading and watching and listening to that we want to give the two thumbs up to? 
You should begin. Okay, I will. Um, so this month I have got a couple of things to recommend. First up is um, Kiki and Kitty from the ABC, which is um, written and she stars in it and she's probably a producer and all sorts of things because she's an amazing, amazing woman, Nakia Louie. Um, so Kiki and Kitty. Nakia plays Kiki, mm -hmm. who um, she is, uh, she's an Aboriginal woman and she is a, a young lawyer in a law firm. Kitty is her vagina who comes to, uh, comes to life or 3D form separate from Kiki after a wild night. Um, and it is, it's hilarious. Um, it's very endearing. Uh, it's very clever. Um, there's some very subtle and not so subtle jabs at um, racism and colonization and those sorts of things. Um, just, just wonderful and some really laugh out loud funny mm. moments um just yeah it's spectacular i can't recommend it enough it's just on iview so you can just jump on iview and binge watch all the episodes which is exactly what i did and i highly recommend it um and it's fantastic and the woman that plays um kitty her name is uh elaine oh her surname is escaping me at the moment but she is hilarious she is amazing and she is yeah anyway two thumbs up definitely watch absolutely spectacular um and the other thing is something that i've just really recently come across it's the kitchen sisters presents podcast which is stories from the b-side of history and it's really really interesting um they're very um the episodes have a lot of texture to them in that there's um you know it's not just one person speaking there's a lot of like noise and there's music and there's it feels um feels like there's a lot of texture to the mm. to the listening it's it's really that's a really lovely experience um i've only listened to a handful of episodes so far um but they're really quite wide ranging um the idea of food in kitchens is kind of a reoccurring theme i'm not sure if that's where the head the um the name of the podcast is from but mm. it's neither here nor there um a really wonderful one that i list, just listened to yesterday is um george is about georgia gilmore who's one of the unsung heroes of the civil rights movement in in the us um and what she did was to make um cakes and pies and things and sell them to raise money for the civil rights movement um yeah just a really wonderful story and there's an episode on um, traveler girls which is really interesting as well they're quite short they're not very long episodes so anywhere from about 15 minutes to maybe 25 have been what i've seen mm -hmm. um but yeah really interesting um you know gives you those kind of little insights into stories that don't make the mainstream narrative um yeah and just a really lovely listening experience so that's my two for the month oh nice they both sound great. Mm. Yeah. I'm yeah. Definitely kicking kitty, I just honestly is one of the best things I've seen this year. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> the whole concept of your vagina coming to life and being like a fit like she's like a fairy godmother. <laughs> you know, and she helps um Kiki like discover what she really wants and, you know, has a helps her have her first orgasm and you know all these sorts of really great things and it's just it's um it's a lot of fun i just can't cannot recommend it enough oh that sounds wonderful yeah, yeah. so watching that on abc i view <laughs> yes <laughs> all right who's next all right um me i was like do we do scissors paper rock but that's so visual so i suppose it's you <laughs> <laughs> all right okay cool cool i've got three recommendations the first one is a um novel it's called you know me well it's by david levithan and nina lakua uh, co-write it it's basically about uh two teenagers one who's called kate um kate's basically uh she's uh, she's known she's like a lesbian for a long time, but she's never had like a long term girlfriend because she's known about this um, girl who's this like this dream girl who's a friend of a friend and who's like traveled around the world. And so she's like fantasized about this girl and built her up so much in her mind that when the time comes for her to actually meet her, 
she sort of just freaks out and runs away where she bumps into the other protagonist who is Mark. Now Mark has this sort of semi maybe unrequited love interest with his also gay friend and they're in the club like because it's Sid and Pride Week in San Fran I think so like there's a great vibe around this book just generally um and so he's trying to figure out whether sort of whether he like that relationship because it's incredibly complicated they're like their friendship's really intense he wants more he's not sure about what his friend wants and so Kate and Mark basically need each other when they both really need a friend and they sort of fill that like um they feel that void within each other and they help each other out and it's just really great because for one thing this this thing in LGBT um q literature that, or like in movies actually more so that for some reason like lesbians and gay men aren't friends or like mm. they're antagonistic which in my experience is complete bullshit so I was, I was like that's a great dynamic plus it's one of those things where though their like queerness comes into play to the in the book it's not the entirety of the book it's basically just two love stories um and uh one sort of has a happier ending one is a little bit more sort of this development of the self and sort of figuring out things but yeah both are really well written i love david levithan like so much i never read nina lakua but i'm definitely gonna look her up after you know i go through most of my tbr because (laughs) (laughs) because she's also amazing so sounds great yeah good book um so second recommendation is called the gentleman's guide to vice and virtue it's by mackenzie lee uh basically (laughs) this is a book set in sort of victorian era where um sort of noble sons would go on a grand tour around Europe. So they would go, basically, it was sort of seen as this time where they can expand their, like, their worldview and, like, you know, sort of absorb the culture, sort of have a bit, sort of like a rumspringer almost before they go back and learn, like, basically how to be landowners and do all sort of that, like, shoulder that responsibility. Um, so the main character in this book is Monty. He, again, has, like, a sort of maybe unrequited crush on his friend Percy. Um, great name. I was just thinking that. Yeah, the name Percy. Percy. Fabulous. (laughs) Um, and it's really interesting because, um, Percy is, uh, sort of, um, I think he's, uh, mixed race or basically it's sort of, I can't remember if it's explicitly said, but, um, yeah, he's definitely he's dark skinned, and that sort of plays a factor into how he's treated in this time. Uh, his sister comes along, and there's a really interesting reveal about her later on. Um, and so, what I really enjoyed about this book not only is it really fun and playful, but it doesn't shy away from some of the stuff that Victorian era books kind of either don't deal with or deal with badly. So things like women's rights and the fact that slavery exists Mm -hmm. or like existed in some parts of the world um what do you mean um how do they deal with it in this book uh well I can't it's like present or is it a plot point it's present and the people who speak about it are people who are coming from that experience like there's not a sort of speak there's not it's not like a a eroticized or a sort of oh this is so sad like it's I can't really talk about it too much because it's sort of spoilery but the um the characters are speaking from lived experience yeah exactly so it's not yeah it's not sort of glancingly passed over but it is sort of addressed um I don't know it's it's hard to explain without spoiling the actual plot but I think it's yeah it's fairly well done and better than (coughs) Outland (coughs) uh (laughs) which um as much as I have really loved um I've only watched the tv show just to sort of preface that um there have just been times where especially in Regency Georgian and Victorian era sort of literature and movies have kind of been 
pretty shitty about dealing yeah. with race. Whereas I think this the author also like has like a um there's in the author's notes she actually goes into like uh, sort of the actual facts of the time and sort of you can tell that the author has really like put a lot of thought and effort into creating that t- sort of really nu- nuanced portrayal. So yeah, very nice. Um, and then my last recommendation is a documentary called Kiki. Um, basically, it's about the ballroom sort of Vogue um, scene uh, with uh, LGBTQ youth of colour in, uh, I think, New York. It's kind of seen as like this unofficial sequel to the Paris is Burning documentary. And it's just like a really well done documentary, like um, all the it goes into the lives of specific um, people. It talks about the ballroom scene and how it provides sanctuary for like youth that are often really at risk for various reasons. Um, it's watching it now is really it's kind of a little bit heartbreaking in a sort of fridge horror way because it was um, filmed in like Obama era and there was they were talking about like the politics then of like you know you can't you, of uh, how often people of, of um, power don't understand sort of the day-to-day struggle or what people who are marginalized actually need because they just have none of that lived experience in terms of like allocating funds for you know and doing all that so watching it is kind of hard in that respect but also it's just really interesting and learning about it's just I think for many, so many people like that type of lived experience is so different from what we've experienced ourselves so I think it's just like good to learn yeah, yeah. sounds great yes thanks Neve. what you got the got some books <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been doing quite a bit of reading lately because the heat is on so I've been avoiding the sun um I made a really fun discovery of this series that is um, being produced by Geronimo Press, uh, which is an independent publishing house based in New South Wales. Mm. And they have a thing called the Southern Latitudes um, book series, where I picked up um, a novella by Marina uh, Dimo Lopez, uh, an Argentinian writer, and it's called All My Goodbyes. And basically the series is... Um, actively trying to publish authors from the Southern Hemisphere to kind of address the imbalance of um, we mainly stock Northern Hemisphere authors or um, kind of have an Australian focus, whereas there's so many books um, and literature available from across the Southern Hemisphere. So mm-hmm. they're really trying to promote that. That's and great. Yeah, it's um, there are two books so far in the series so I've gobbled up both of them and they're quite different the first one that I read is um, a fiction book which is all my goodbyes and it is like being in a dream you never know exactly where you are time slips in and out and there are kind of several strands of stories happening where you kind of pull in and out of each strand of the story as you go along and you know that a terrible crime has happened from the blurb at the back of the book. So I kind of really wonder how my reading experience would have been hinged on not reading that. So I knew that there was a murder. Um, I didn't know who died at what point. And this woman is constantly moving and is on the run. And at the beginning, it's sort of she's running because she doesn't want to um, stay at home and be stuck caring for her father, um, who's quite unwell. And she's anytime he becomes sicker, she's the next day is kind of like, sorry, guys, I've got a plane ticket to leave. Um, So it's kind of a really interesting look at her family and her reasons for running and breaking off relationships. And she kind of jumps around the world and she's quite proud of having a list of many different occupations. And it goes into the idea of work and responsibility, responsibility for looking after yourself and loved ones, community, and the idea of not having a set community. 
The writing is incredibly evocative. It's very poetic. It's very fragmentary. It's very spacey, tangential, but it all ties together quite nicely. So you, as you move through the novella, you're starting to understand why she's done certain things at certain points. So it's really quilted together in an exceptional way. Um, I was fortunate enough to have read most of it in one sitting, which I think really helped hold all that information in my head. I think it would be quite hard to read over a series of weeks in like 10 minute sessions or whatever. Um, but the writing was just something else. Like, you know, when it's so atmospheric, you kind of feel a little bit sick, but excited and just kind of like in awe of the words, but a little bit confronted. It was, you know, it was a like being in a washing machine switched on. So I'll be adding that one to my list. Cool. Please do. And the cover <laughs> itself is just this this image of it's look it up, it'll be in the show notes. I can't describe art and I won't attempt. <laughs> and the second one in the series, and the second one that I read is a collection of essays by Ashley Young, a New Zealand writer, and she won that major nonfiction award that Helen Garner won um the year before last. The the one where Helen Garner, the email went to her um, junk bo- like inbox and she didn't yeah. see it. Yep. That's the same that <laughs> happened to um, this lady as well. It went to her junk? It didn't go to her junk, but she read it and thought, this is spam. What is this? And showed it. she works as an editor in a publishing house and she showed her colleague and her colleague was like, oh my God. Um, so I think that's telling us that the people that are awarding that prize need to do something about their communication because it's yeah. not great. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, please continue. Uh, so that's a major uh, nonfiction writing prize that's awarded through Yale University and each winner gets $200,000 US, I think. And they give it to about six or eight people each year. Um, life-changing, amazing. Jesus, get on it. Um, and this is her first collection of essays. Like, so a bull out of the gate. Wow. Um, Can You Tolerate This is the name of the collection. And I had a chance to describe this book to you, Kirby, the other week. And it was like coming home and not even realizing that I'd been away from home. It was so stunning and warm. And her writing style is exciting and inviting. And it's kind of... um, has the observational style of Helen Garner, that very kind of evocative, very specific, minute Mm. details, but she's got like the warmth and humour of Bill Bryson because Helen Garner can be a little bit clinical at times and kind of is a observer from afar, I feel, and she gazes out across the room, whereas sort of, you know, Bill Bryson is like a humour kind of anti sort of style writer so it's kind of the meeting of those two voices in the one book so it was a really warm gorgeous look at the world and she talks about the essays are wide ranging and one she talks about body hair and her father pointing out that she has a moustache and that goes into women with facial hair into a lot of detail and how society looks at hair on women and then another one she talks, and it's an extremely long essay, this next one, about her brother's red coat. And it's hilarious and heartbreaking. And it's just this story of the red coat. And it goes through the New Zealand music scene, rural living, kind of uh, lots of different themes. And her writing is just kind of skates in and out and crosses so, many, so much terrain. And there's this one essay about a dog that she has, a dash hound, and I just kind of almost, like, a lot of times I, I just, so I do get sentimental at times, but this is... <laughs> just not about Christmas. Just not about Christmas. This collection of essays is... It sounds amazing, mm. and I'm literally going to maybe go and I might go buy it tonight I'm gonna go (laughs) buy a copy because I borrowed it from the library and I was literally afraid of hurting this book because I was hugging it so hard it is I just I have like a balloon in my chest of just so much joy from this book it is top of the pile and the exciting thing is she blogs yeah so we'll link to her blog as well yeah and she like she just writes about random funny things it's like 
if I could have a voice in my head, I want it to be her. It's just whispering me things. Wow. Because it's just really lovely. That's huge. And um, the last one is a collection of short stories uh, by Laurie Moore. Uh, it's called Bark, and it's just a romp. It's just short stories that are very um, PC at times in terms of the characters are flawed human beings who say awful things, just terrible things. Um, so I blushed quite a bit, and it's a lot of um, uh, sim- there's quite a strong vein going through the um, collection of short stories of marriages breaking down and um, kind of dysfunction sort of happening uh, towards the end of relationships. So I just kind of found that quite interesting that there could be so much humor and laugh out loud sort of humor related to that because um, that's sort of a thing that's quite um, common in novels of uh, talking about marriage and stuff, whereas uh, Laurie Moore comes at it from a very fantastic angle, very surprising angle a lot of the times. Um, And she's heralded as one of the best American short story writers, apparently, from the cover. (laughs) From the cover? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot of praise for her in the cover. And I was like, I haven't heard of you. I think I've actually heard of that book. That that title sounds really familiar, but Mm. I haven't haven't actually read it. So It's a good collection. Totes recommend. Awesome some cool recommendations now we did want to briefly chat about our 2018 reading goals Mm. um i have a couple i spent most of 2017 reading books by women and when i look back through my goodreads i'm pretty sure i the only place where i might have read anything by men was a collection of the best australian science writing I'm pretty sure everything else was written by a woman, which was not something I started out the year planning to do, but as the months progressed, decided that was going to be what was going to happen. Um, so I will probably, I won't strictly keep to that next year, but I will endeavour to continue to read lots and lots of women because mm. I think they're rad. Um, I do want to track a little bit more what I'm reading, like be a little bit more um, aware of what I'm reading in terms of translated books and the um, where the book is from. So if it's a written by a Japanese author, or if it's written Mm -hmm. by an Irish author, or if it's written by a New Zealand writer, like I want to sort of track that and be across that a little bit more. and I also want to kind of expand out into, and Fee, we have discussed this, into a bit more sort of genre stuff, um, particularly like that sci-fi kind of stuff that I generally steer away from. And I do want to read a little bit more um, YA and things like that yeah. next year as well. So that's kind of my reading goals. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose I think I'm sort of the reverse of you as opposed I. Like, I read a lot of genre stuff and I read a lot of YA and that's where I'm really comfortable with and I I love reading it but I kind of want to expand into different canons so I've I want to I think there there are a couple of different ones like I really want to read more Latin American women because there's a canon there that I know is really rich Mm. and I've read about it but I haven't actually read a lot of the books in that so I want to dive into that um when we went to the uh, Kill Your Darlings book quiz, that was really embarrassing because I didn't know of so many Australian books. And I feel like I've grown up ingrained with a sort of like, um, uh, what's the phrase? The sort of the self... Cultural cringe. Yes, thank you. The sort of the cultural cringe in terms of Australian literature. Um, and I think I sort of need to like try and move past that which I sort of have started to do but I've only done really done it with more modern authors I think I should read a little bit more historical Australian fiction yeah try to do that also I kind of want to dip into a bit more Irish fiction as well (laughs) so that's kind of my well I feel I feel like there's a whole canon there reading as as well you know of heritage that might be nice to dip into absolutely that yeah. sounds like some fantastic goals yeah so there's my sort of three main prongs what about you fee 
I am, as you mentioned, Kirby, I'm keen to get on the genre boat. Um, <laughs> I don't, don't know if uh, listeners have picked up on the fact that I do enjoy nonfiction quite a bit mm. and <laughs> don't often read things with plot. So I'm going to try and um, give that a bit more of a chance. I've really enjoyed this year um, starting to read YA stuff. Um, it's been really fantastic. Um, it's kind of the only really YA stuff I've read. I kind of read when I was like in primary school, like Roald Dahl and all the rest of it. But it, there's so many fantastic books that I'm really excited to read. And I also, like you were saying about the sci-fi stuff, I've been told for many, many years by one of my siblings to get on board with that and. I know that this is going to reveal character traits of mine, but I kind of want to read a few and then just name drop them in conversations with him and be like, oh yeah, <laughs> read that. Mm-hmm. Or what did you think of X, Y, and Z? And just, you know, be that annoying sibling, which I am all the time. <laughs> so that's my master plan for the year is to continue to be Lord Voldemort. And yeah. <laughs> How did you not get Slytherin and the... Because I'm friendly. I'm a Hufflepuff. (laughs) And I'm not brave. I like to stay home and like tend the plants and read the books like a good old Hufflepuff. (laughs) Excellent. These all sound like very worthy goals, so I'm excited to jump into um, 2018's reading. Mm. So am I. I just want to throw the towel in at work and be like, sorry guys, I'm not responding to any more emails. I'm staying home with my books. If only, if only. Well, thank you for listening to Literary Cannonball. We hope you'll tune in again next month when we'll be talking about Water for Chocolate by Laura Esquivel. I think so, yes. Um, that's got recipes in it too, so we've got a little bit of a theme happening here yeah. with uh, Jeanette Winterson and Water for Chocolate. So um, but I'm really looking forward to that one. I know you guys have both read it mm-hmm. and I have not. So this is kind of going to be like a capture the castle thing. Yes. That flipped. <laughs> um, but I'm really, I actually got my copy today. So I'm really excited to, to dive into that. Yeah. Oh, it's such a gorgeous book. Is it? <gasps> oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. From what I remember, I read it a few years ago. All right. In the meantime, if you want to continue the conversation or if you just want to be digital friends, you can follow us at Twitter at Lit Cannibal or on Instagram at Literary Cannibal or find us on Facebook. And if you have something to tell us that's a little more than 140 characters, send us an email. We love to get emails at literarycannibal at gmail.com. And make sure you check out our website. We do have quite a list of recommendations this episode and that's literarycannibal.com and you'll also find kind of notes about our previous episodes and stuff and you can listen to them and if you have enjoyed the convo this year leave us a rating and review on itunes or wherever else uh, we only accept five star ratings, so <laughs> keep that in mind. And make sure you tell a friend. We've got a bit of a community growing, and we'd like to, you know, get more peeps who are keen on books and stuff. To... We we love our book loving friends. Yeah. Oh my goodness, they're the best. They're so stacked. <laughs> <laughs> love to finish the year on a pun. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, Merry Christmas to all our listeners. I hope you have a Christmas filled with books and reading and maybe a little cheeky cocktail. Yeah. And to all those who celebrate different holidays, happy holidays. Absolutely. Likewise, filled with books and reading yes. and a little cheeky cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> N- note that there is there are several elements that you should just unilaterally do. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's us out. Okay. Bye. Bye. If you're like circling around the same themes with your recommendations, like mm. that's obviously just telling us where your like interests lie. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's totally okay. <laughs> yeah, I suppose this is true. But they're probably just like, Neve, another fucking gay Victorian book, can you not? <laughs> 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 and-
And the response was like, there's not many for me to burn through, to be fair. Also, <laughs> I don't think anyone's actually said that to me. <laughs> so I'd be very and I'd be very surprised if people are actually having those reactions to your recommendations. <laughs> I don't know, it's my imagined audience. <laughs>